Hi folks, it's good to be with you. Uh, love to everybody out there. And uh, it's good to be with you. Uh, my name is Jason Burns. And uh, you can get me at my website, jasonburnspreacher.com. You can also get me at uh, my Facebook, where you'll see lots of Bible teaching like Alistair Begg, John MacArthur. And then you can also get me on Twitter, where you'll see lots of apologetic material material uh, by a great apologist and on my website you can see lots of books lots of articles and material to encourage you in theology today I'm responding to a video uh, by um, a chap called Bob the Builder and this video um, it, it might be quite a lengthy video it might go into two videos but um, as far as I'm concerned, Bob's uh, a wonderful brother in Christ and um, I greatly respect him and I know that uh, some of my friends in Manchester who come with me to uh, Hyde Park that I can say on behalf of them and myself that we are thrilled to see your ministry prosper and blessed and um, you are an inspiration to us and that goes for all the apologists down there at Hyde Park such as Lizzie, Daniel, Godwin and many others. Uh, you are an inspiration to us and a great encouragement to us and we have learned so much from you and we see you as brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, and I, I can say that in my own life a ministry, uh, it's just been a thrill to see the work that's been going on at Hyde Park by Bob the Builder and by, by others. So this video is not an attack on Bob Builder, it's not an attack on um, the uh, work that's being done by apologists down there. And secondly, um, also this video covers issues concerning Jay Smith and James White. The same goes for them, they are great brothers in Christ, doing a great work. So it's not an attack on them too, uh, I greatly respect them and I've learnt much from them and you know, so please uh, nobody think or try to think that this is a, a case of, um, of attacking our brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, we are all brothers and sisters in Christ and we are together and that's where it's at. Uh, the other issue is the reason why I'm doing this video is because <clears throat> I've noticed <clears throat> over the last year uh, the defining of scripture, of what scripture is has kind of moved its goalpost and there seems to be amongst modern evangelicals certain definitions of scripture that need to be challenged because if they're not challenged it will sow the seeds of the destruction of many of the Lord's people and also there's certain other issues concerning the preservation of scripture and the textual criticism that need to be addressed so that our apologetics is much more robust especially in the area of apologetics to Islam. Um, I do believe that our apologetics to Islam as Islam grows stronger in the West our apologetics needs to be more robust and I do think that there's certain views on textual, textual criticism and on the nature of scripture as well that are weakening our defense of the faith towards Islam. So that's my motivation for why I'm making this video. Why me? I don't know. Um, it should be people, people who have uh, a wider influence in theology, a wider influence in um, 
academia, um, a wider influence in the church. It should be people like that that are actually tackling this issue, not me. But it's left to me to bring the issue up, so I'm going to bring the issue up because I think it's so important. Okay, I'm going to pray. I would ask people to, rather than just reject outright what I'm saying, to go away and study the resources and the, the things that I put to you, rather than just dismiss uh, from what I'm about to say. My background is I'm Reformed, I'm Calvinistic, I'm Reformed. Um, I stand on the faith of Francis Schaeffer, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, Spurgeon. And um, so I'm coming from this, from a classical Protestant position uh, from what I'm about to go and share with you. So, okay. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love and your grace and your care and we give you the prayers and the glory. And Lord, I just pray that this video might be a blessing to people, a help to people, and an encouragement to people. And I pray that uh, this video will be a blessing to people. In Jesus' name. May your Holy Spirit be here, Lord, and bless us. May we learn from your word. In Jesus' name. And bless our brothers and sisters. Bless Bob. Bless Bless all those down at Hyde Park who are doing a, a wonderful work. Bless them, Lord, mightily for your glory. And bless James White and bless Jay Smith. Thank you for raising such amazing guys and for the wonderful work they're doing. Bless them, encourage them, strengthen them, refresh them, renew them, and just bless them, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm just going to get a drink of water, so I'll just be one second. Okay, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> there are specific issues, uh, Bob, that it, it is specific to your own uh, theology that I want to deal with. And also there are issues, not only in what you said, but also um, that, have, uh, that are, are, are wi in wider evangelical and academic circles. So there's two things there, your own specific theology and also um, uh, theology, theological reflection that also impacts and has impacted and is impacting the wider church and these are the issues that I want to tackle. So if we, I'd like to start off by looking at uh, some scripture and um, if anybody wants to uh, study theology, systematic theology I would encourage you to get hold of this book by uh, Robert L. Raymond, Dr. Robert L. Raymond A New Systematic Theology, Thomas Nelson. I'd encourage all the I'd encourage you, Bob, to get hold of this copy, and I would get all, I would encourage all the apologists at Hyde Park to get a copy of this, to devour it, to read it, because it will really help you in your apologetics and defence of the faith against uh, Islam, because he covers a lot of issues in the systematic theology on the nature of Scripture that will be a help in the defence of the faith. So. That's uh, A New Systematic Theology of the Christian Faith by Dr. Robert L. Raymond. And um, he quotes uh, Exodus chapter 4 verse 10 to 16, Exodus chapter 7 
verse 1 to 4. So we read these words. Moses said to the Lord, O Lord, I have ne never been eloquent, neither in past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech, of tongue. The Lord said to him, Who gave man his mouth, who makes him deaf or dumb, who gave him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, O Lord, please send someone else to do it. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said, What about your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak well. He already, he is already on his way to meet you, and his heart will be glad when he sees you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if he were your mouth. And as if you were God to him. That's Exodus 4, verse 10 to 16. Exodus 7, verse 1 to 4. I'm going to read from uh, the King James as well. Uh, Exodus, Exodus 7, 1 to 4. Exodus uh, chapter... 7 1 to 4 and the Lord said unto Moses see I have made thee a God to Pharaoh and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet thou shalt speak all that I command thee and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh that he send the children of Israel out of his hand and I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt for Pharaoh shall not, not hearken unto you, that I may lay my hand upon Egypt, and bring forth my armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt, by great judgments. So I'll just read what Raymond says here. God declares that he who made man's mouth would be with Moses to teach him what to say to the people of Israel and to Pharaoh, Exodus 4.12. When Moses continued to object that, what he was not, that he was not eloquent, God declared that Moses would become like God to Pharaoh, Exodus 7.1, and would utilize as his prophet, uh, it's Nabi in Hebrew, Exodus 7.1, and that Aaron would speak to the people and to Pharaoh for Moses as if he were, as if he were your mouth and if you were God to him. So here in this scripture, what we're seeing is, is that um, Moses and Aaron are speaking as if they're speaking the very word of God. And God also says that I give you the words, not just the message, but I give you the words. So what we're seeing here before we begin is we're defining scripture, what scripture is, and the nature of scripture via scripture. Now what you did, Bob, is you didn't do that. You defined scripture via community. And that's a completely different way of defining scripture. You first started off in your video and you basically said that uh, the scripture was created by the community for the community and this was your axiom this was your your basic uh, plank your basic foundation scripture was by the community for the community then you went into an exegetical defense of that by going into 1 corinthians 15 uh, which uh, we're going to look at now So you went into a, a, an exegetical defense of the position that scripture was formed by a community for a community. But this was the heart of your defense, of your position. And you took us to 1 Corinthians 15 and it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you received, 
wherein we stand, but which also you are saved if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to Scripture, and that he was buried, and that he was rose again on the third day according to the Scripture, and that he was seen of Cephas, and then of the twelve, and that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, for whom the greater part remain unto this present. So, your defence of your position is Scripture was formed by community for community. Then you took us to this passage. And then you talked about the kerygma. And you said, look, here, the kerygma was preached, the message was preached, and they didn't have, like, books, because it wasn't, um, it, it, they, they didn't have the printing press. So they had to survive on the kerygma. And this is your foundation for launching later on, even though you give us some other passages like uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3.16, where you talk about God's scripture is God breathed. You didn't go into the specific nature in any in depth on that particular passage. But your springboard was, and your foundation is, that, that um, we don't have to worry about your whole argument, your whole thesis rests on this idea of community. So that whenever we get textual variants, like, for example, the, the woman caught of committing adultery, uh, or the last ending of Mark, Whenever we get a, a textual variant, you can say, well, it doesn't matter because it doesn't affect the message. And the argument that we can say that is, look, the early church didn't have the word of God in its entirety. They had the kerygma, the message. So it's the message that is important, not the words. So this is the kind of... Um, argument that you made and what I'm saying to you that that argument is flawed because we don't define the nature of scripture via community we define the nature of scripture from scripture itself and you missed out in your presentation in your video when you read this passage in 1 Corinthians 15 if you look verse 3 for I delivered unto you first of all that which also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. So it's not true to say that the early church just preached the kerygma without any reference to the authority of scripture because they referred back to the Old Testament. If you read Josephus, uh, you'll find that there's a great emphasis in his book on uh, the history of the Jews, that the Jewish people were a people of the book. Um, if you read some of the early church works, uh, the Didache and other, other uh, early church writings, uh, you'll find that the church had teachers, people who uh, taught, and part of that teaching was they preached and the community had the preaching of the word within the community so your picture of the early church that there was just they preached the charisma i.e the death and resurrection of christ but there was in a sense they were just bothered about the message not the word it's just not accurate from a biblical perspective and from a uh, historical perspective. You see, pros processism has always defined, evangelicalism has always defined scripture via scripture, not by a com via community. Because if you define scripture from community, you leave yourself open to the secular historian who will come at community from a different perspective from you. So for example, 
Um, you have Dr. Bauer in the 1930s who had uh, various ideas about community concerning the early church. And in fact, when you look at the history of uh, systematic theology, biblical theology, canonical studies, and textual criticism, when you look back at these disciplines in uh, Western academia, uh, there has always been an emphasis on the, um, the importance of defining scripture from community. But that's not a, a, the Protestant evangelical position. That's a, a modern position that has developed from uh, a post-enlightenment um, secular academic um, thinking, influenced in part by Roman Catholicism. Because Roman Catholicism takes the view, or has taken the view, there's a variety of theologians today, but Roman, the uh, Roman Catholicism has taken the view that it was the community that defined what is in the canon and what is the canon. Uh, liberal Protestantism from Harnack uh, right up to Bultmann have always had this idea of that it's the community that defined what was in the scripture. Because they want to bring a wedge between um, the message and the scripture. You see, if you say uh, the most important thing is that we look at the community first, uh, what that does by implication is take away from the authority of Scripture. Because now we're looking at what the community says, what is the, the formation, uh, what, how the community looks at things. But if we do that, we can err because we're just engaged in pure historical inquiry from a human perspective and humans can err and so our historical, historical inquiry can err. What we need before we go into historical inquiry, because every historical inquiry, whether it's from a textual critical basis or whether it, it, it's from um, analysing community in ancient cultures, every historical inquiry has bias. The secularist has bias, the Muslim has bias, the atheist has bias. So no historical inquiry is going to be looking at it purely objectively. So you need to have the right presupposition, the right foundation to be able to look at community. And that perspective is from a biblical perspective. So the point what I'm trying to say is that your video jumps straight in to defining scripture via community and fail to pick up in your exegesis that the community was actually rooted in scripture. It, like again, this is the one of the main passages that you, you said here, 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. It says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. So the early church, when they were preaching the death and resurrection of Christ, they were doing it also on the basis of that this was no new faith, that this was rooted in the Scriptures in the Old Testament. So, to come back, um, my main point is, specifically with you, Bob, you're defining scripture via community first. That is a kind of Roman Catholic, quasi-Roman Catholic, post-enlightenment, secular academic way of thinking. And if you, which I think you probably have, if you have engaged in academic studies in, in the academy, so for example, um, I've done a, about eight years full-time academic study, in theology. Um, you'll find there are certain buzzwords that can be traced back not only in this present time but traced back right back to the post enlightenment uh, thinking in, in theologians like Harnack and Bultmann etc and many 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 scholars today um, are influenced by those presuppositions 
But when you're when you're involved in academic theology and, st and study, there are certain buzzwords that you hear that are repeated ad nauseum, and those buzzwords are community and charisma, and those are the buzzwords that you used. So what that tells me that is you are probably engaged in some academic study in theology at the moment, and you've taken on board the presuppositions of the academy without critically thinking about it theologically, from a theological position, rather than pure, purely from a, a, a university academic way of thinking. And so you missed the important passage here in your exegesis on the issue of scripture as part of the, the charisma, that the apostles only had authority of that Jesus died and rose again because that their authority was rooted in the Old Testament and even our Lord Jesus Christ only had authority in that he had fulfilled the Old Testament you know so the early church was a community of scripture okay they didn't have all the, the New Testament right at the beginning but they had scripture, they had the Old Testament, okay? So, if we go to um, So now, now what we need to do is define scripture rather than by community but by scripture itself. So if you look at Numbers chapter 12 verse 6 to 8 Numbers uh, 12, 6 to 8. It says in Numbers 12, 6 to 8. And he said to her, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all my house. With him I will speak mouth to mouth even apparently, and not in dark speeches, and the similitude of the Lord shall be behold. Wherefore, then, were, were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? With him I will speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in a dark speech, and the multitude of the Lord shall behold. Wherefore, then, when you are not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So here, definition of scripture here is that the, the Lord's mouthpiece, Moses, was speaking the very word of what God wanted. So that's, um, that's, that's, the next scripture is Deuteronomy 18, 14, 42. Deuteronomy 18, 42. Deuteronomy 18, 42. Deuteronomy 18, sorry, 18, chapter 18, sorry about this, my eyes are getting bad these days, Deuteronomy 18, 14, verse 21, for these nations which thou shalt possess hearken unto observers of the time, unto diviners, but also for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee to do so. The, the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee by the brethren like unto me. Unto him you shall hearken according to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb. In the day of the assembly say, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see the great fire any more, that I die not. And the Lord said unto me, they have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and I will put my, here we, here we go, my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he will speak in my name, I will require of them. So, 
here God clearly states that his words are important. This is the definition of scripture now, defining what scripture is. And here we have scripture telling us that God sees his word as inspired. And it's very important because your definition, a modern evangelical's definition is, it's the message is important, not the words. But what we're seeing here is this is not correct, exegetically, what the Bible teaches. We go to Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. And, and, and the reason why this is important, we don't get to define what Scripture is. We don't get to define what we think Scripture is or how we think Scripture is. And this is the problem with modern academic theology and the problem with many evangelicals. They, they are so culturally influenced by academia or culturally influenced by their emotions or culturally influenced by the culture around them and their own thinking that they're, they're not rooted in proper exegesis of the Word of God. And as we go to the Scripture and let Scripture speak on this definition of Scripture, the nature of Scripture, then this idea that it's the message that's important but not the words is just unbiblical. It's just not what the Bible teaches. And that's the key. It's not what culture says or what I think or what my emotions think or what philosophers think or what academics think. It's ultimately what the scriptures say about the scripture. So if we turn to Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, we read, And the Lord answered, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. And the Lord answered and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon the tablets, that he may run and read it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Here, which we'll get on to uh, in another, uh, later on in, in this video, uh, here, it was, the scripture was to be written down and it was to be preserved. It was written on tablets and it was to be preserved. So this idea that uh, you can have a book with passages in the book but it's not of the Bible, from this passage is unbiblical. Because here it's saying there was a tablet written and that tablet was the was preserved to be preserved because we were to watch for the fulfillment of what was written down. Um, so, somebody who says, well, there are textual variants, but it doesn't matter because it's the message. It does matter because God in His Word here shows that His Word is preserved, can be preserved. He preserves His Word, which we're going to get onto. Um, so this is a direct variance to modern evangelical thinking and modern uh, academic studies uh, in the nature of scripture is the nature of scripture is that it is to it, 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 inherent within it is to be preserved okay which we'll look at later on but what we've learned so far is that there were people like Moses who spoke of the words of God. Secondly, that the words, specifically words, were important to God, that carried the message. And thirdly, that these words were to be preserved, that God would preserve his word. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4 to 10. 
Jeremiah chapter 1. And the other thing as well is there was the human element. There were Moses and other prophets like Habakkuk that were given these messages. So they had this human element within it. But they were seen as the very, very word of God. What God had given them. Okay. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 4 to 10. Then the word of the Lord came unto me saying. Now it wasn't a message here. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest uh, out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. And notice he says, all that I shall send thee, whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. So imagine like the Lord tells uh, Jeremiah certain things to say. Jeremiah turns up to the king or some leader and says, you know, God told me specifically this, this and this. But you know what? I don't have to tell you about this bit because... It's the message. I want to get the general message to you. Of what God's saying. No. That, that is not what we see in the text. All that, I shall, all that I shall send thee. Whatsoever I command thee. Thou shalt speak. So the prophet here. Is to speak all that God has commanded. So any person comes along today and says. You know. Um, it's the message not the words important well God says all that I've commanded speak it's a human thinking a human philosophy a human idea saying it, it sounds palatable it sounds uh, fair and educational it sounds wise but it's not what God teaches the idea that it's the message that matters, not the words. That is not what God teaches. That's man's idea. It's not God's idea. It's not God's teaching. God here says, All that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shall speak. Whatsoever I command thee, thou shall speak. Because The message is encoded in the word, in the word of God. And it's the word of God that protects the message, that defends the message. So, for example, when the early church were preaching, as you would call the kerygma, uh, that Jesus died and rose again. It was the word that protected that message. It was the Old Testament that defended that message. That they could say, Paul could say, and the apostles yeah, we've seen the Lord rise. We've seen the Lord's teaching. But the Lord Jesus Christ is the true prophet, the true Son of God. He is the Son of God because we can show you in the Old Testament. We can back it up. It's not a new teaching. This is, this is from the Scripture. You see. They had the Scripture to show the people that their interpretation of the events was the right interpretation. And what academic theology does is to try and create a wedge. Harnack and uh, Bultmann and many of the academic theologians today, uh, they don't do it, some of them don't do it purposely, but m many of them do it unwittingly. But many of them do it purposely to try and create a wedge between the message and the word. Because once you dislodge the message from the word, then you can control the interpretation of the message. So, for example, in the time of the 19th century uh, theology, um, liberal theologians would, uh, would go on about this, that it, it's not the words that are important, it's the message. So then, 
they're able to say, well, the message is God is love. God is a father God. And then the evangelical comes on, yeah, said, but, but in the Bible, in the word of God, it says that God is a God of wrath. Oh, no, 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 it's, no, you got it all wrong. It's the, it's the message that's important, not the words. And you evangelicals telling us that in the Bible it says this about God in his word. Well, you, 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 you're kind of worshipping the Bible. We worship Jesus. And it's the message that's important, not the words. So it stops the evangelical from giving the correct interpretation or correct teaching about the nature of God. So academic theology has always created a wedge between the word and the message. But the words protect the message. So it's important that we have the accurate word of God because that is the preservation of the message. And we're going to get into that a little bit more. So... So if we go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, one Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of man but as it is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So here's another issue concerning the kerygma, is the kerygma was, the message was seen as part of the word of God, which is an issue that you didn't bring out in your, in your presentation. So even the kerygma, even the message was seen as part, the apostolic teaching was seen as the word of God. Again, not this modern idea that the message is important, but not the words. And that's what I'm concerned about. Because once evangelicals imbibe and keep this teaching, they're opening the, the, themselves up to a can of worms where uh, teachers and in the church that come in, false teachers, and academic theology can then begin to shape modern evangelical in their image because they've cut you off from the importance of the word because you've been drilled uh, into the idea that it's the message not the words it's the message and the words but the words are important the correct words are important knowing that God's word has been preserved and that we have God's words are important because they're the purveyors and the defense of the message they are the foundation of the interpretation of the message. So, um, we turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. Two Peter chapter 3 verse 15 and 16. It says, an account that yeah, two, 2 Peter 3, <laughs> sorry about this, 15 and 16. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and, and unstable rest as they do also other scripture unto their own destruction. So here we learn that uh, Paul's epistles were seen as scripture. So we're seeing that this community saw early on um, that even the apostles were writing scripture, that they were in a time of new letters, new books being written that was scripture. If you turn to, uh, if we go to Jeremiah 32. Uh, 
and I would recommend the book here. Sorry, Jeremiah, I think. Sorry about this. Sorry about this. I um, the scripture that I wanted, I, I can't remember what, what it was, but we'll. We'll, we'll look at Jeremiah, we'll go back to Jeremiah um, in a minute. I have the scripture here that I wanted, but we'll look at that in, in a minute. Um, we'll go to 2 Timothy 3.16. Two Timothy three sixteen. It says all scripture is all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished in all good works. But if you said here something you didn't pick up in your presentation, Bob, it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine. So we're to get our doctrine not from community, but from scripture. And your presentation again was the nature of scripture, our definition of scripture comes primarily first of all from community. And my whole presentation so far is to refute that and to get you to think in a different way. That we define scripture not via community but by scripture. And this very, there's very important uh, epistemological reasons why we do that as well. Epistemology is the theory of knowledge. For any discipline that we engage in as, a, as Christians, especially in historical inquiry, we need to have the right epistemology or theory of knowledge. And what I'm giving you here is a biblical epistemology. Meaning we start our definition of scripture with scripture. And that definition then, we go into our, our historical inquiry with our biblical definition. That's a, a biblical epistemology in looking at historical inquiry. Whereas what you did, Bob, is without a biblical epistemology, you're going straight into historical inquiry saying... Uh, scripture was uh, is formed by community for by community for community. There is the charisma, and etc. And you're defining community. You're defining uh, historical inquiry not via scripture, but via community. Even though you used Bible passages. Those Bible passages are not central to your argument. Your argument was about community. That was your central pass. That was your central argument. That we define Scripture from community. And I've made a, a lot of points, a lot of issues. I'll reiterate again. This idea that we define Scripture by community is a Catholic, a, a, a Catholic idea. But also uh, an idea that was developed in the secular academia from post enlightenment, and it is it is fundamentally flawed because any historical inquiry will have biased and presuppositions, and we can see that. With uh, give you an example with Bultmann, Bultmann had an idea that scripture was formed by community. 
And so he's, he, he had the idea that uh, the community uh, was principally influenced from Greek culture. So anything that was Jewish was not authentic community. And so therefore anything written in scripture that had Jewishness within it was not authentic historically speaking. Now, he came to the understanding that there were certain passages in the, in the New Testament that had a Jewish flavour were not historically true. And he came to that conclusion because he had a view of community, a certain view of community. And he'd been, he's, he's been found to be incorrect because now our studies have found over the last 50, 60 years uh, Bultmann's scholarship has crumbled because we're realising that the New Testament had a Jewish context. But you would have learned that if you'd have gone to the Bible <laughs> and studied your Bible and learned from Scripture. You would have learned that there was a Jewish context from Scripture, not just by looking at ancient history, first of all, as your first primary port of call. Another example is Dr. Bauer, um, Brower, um, who, uh, sorry, Bauer, who in the 1930s uh, wrote a seminal work on textual criticism. And he came at it from the idea of community, but this time in a different way from Bookman. He said there were many communities. There was not just one community. And so if that's the case, scripture could not have been just one scripture uh, one canon there must have been many different canons many different ways of looking at things and modern academic studies today in textual criticism and canon formation are influenced by dr Barr. now his theory is from community so those are two examples i can give you another example uh, an office scholar uh, Dr. Barr, uh, or was an Oxford scholar, well, a very eminent scholar in the late 20th century, would say that evangelicals who say that the words are important and not the me and the message, the message and the words are important, uh, would come at it from the point of view that the evangelicals are scholastics. They're not really in touch with the Word of God, what the Word of God is. And he would be coming at it from a secular point of view that there is no one community, correct? So there can never be a fully inspired text, you see. So what I'm saying is when you start to define scripture via community, you're opening yourself up to a whole can of worms where you can be attacked from many, many fronts by the Muslim apologist. You need a biblical epistemology of what scripture is and we define scripture via scripture. So, so we've done um, the definition of scripture. Okay, we've looked at what scripture is. Uh, in the 2 Timothy passage, scripture is God breathed, and it, it means that the very words of God there are, are breathed out by God. And you didn't bring that out in your, out in your presentation. But it, it, when it says God breathed, if you go to 2 Timothy, which is the passage that you brought us to, one of the passages that you brought us to, Bob, you didn't exegete it properly and the seminal essays on this are by B.B. B. B. Warfield if you want to read up on this text get hold of B.B. Warfield's book on uh, studies uh, there's 10 volumes of B.B. Warfield but if you look at the volume on the na on scripture Warfield goes into this quite in depth but it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for 
reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So here it says all scripture is given by inspiration. It means the idea is God breathed. It means the very words are God breathed. And now here, just a little caveat. You're saying that this means the Old Testament. But actually in... Uh, in I, I can't remember if there's one Timothy or two Timothy. There's actually a quotation from the Gospel of Luke. I'll say that again. There's actually a quotation. I think it's in one Timothy or two Timothy. I can't I can't remember. But there's actually a quotation of the Gospel of Luke within uh, Pauline's letters. I think it's it's either in one Timothy or two Timothy. So when he says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for correction, for instruction, for reproof, it's not just the Old Testament. That's the common uh, exegetical passage that, that academically speaking people would see as referring to the Old Testament. And that would be correct. But there are also uh, a quotation of the Gospel of Luke. So... It, it is a possible argument to make that he's not just talking about the Old Testament. Although, granted, that is the main thing he is talking about. But the point is that Scripture is God-breathed, and he means every word there. He doesn't just mean message. He means every word, which is something that you didn't bring out in your exegesis. So, what we've learned here, Bob, is specifically on your issue... Um, on your um, definition of the nature of scripture is incorrect. We don't go to community first, we go to scripture first. You went straight to community first, then you went to scripture to define. You went to community, then to scripture. I went to scripture first to define scripture. You went to community first to define scripture. There's a two different ways of doing theology. We do theology, first of all, from Scripture. And we define Scripture with Scripture. All right? So, uh, Mark, so look, we give you, I give you the academic reasons why we do that. I've given you epistemological reason, historical reason. I've showed you, I, I've tried to show you from the history of academic theology why it's dangerous to espouse the idea that it's just the message, not the words, that is important. I've, I've tried to give you some indicators uh, in the history of theology uh, with liberalism, and I've tried to show...